We're good. Good, good. So we're just going through the syllabus here. All right. So um, anyway, hopefully you've all been able to get a copy of the book, uh, Jones and Walroth. We will use that uh, pretty extensively. And you should be able to get a pretty cheap copy. Um, the third edition now, I think, has been out for five or six years. So there should be used copies floating around. Um, you can also get an, on, or a, uh, an online copy, all right, a PDF version. Um, but hopefully um, nobody's had a problem with that. You can get back and talk to me if you have had a problem. So Modali, we're going to be an online course, right? And my plan is to try to do this pretty much all synch um, synchronously. So, um, you know, if, if things come up and we have to record lectures and I post them, then we'll do that. But my plan is to do everything in real time. I'm going to try to remember, right? and you guys have to help me, Max knows this, I'm very bad at remembering to record my lectures, but I'm going to try to remember the record, record lectures and share them with you. So that way, if you have any connection issues, if something comes up and you have to miss a class or whatever, it will be out there. If you, if you missed you know, something and you want to go back and rewatch a section, it will be out there for you to get them. I usually upload them to YouTube. And so hopefully it will be a little bit easier for all of you to get access to. So that, that's going to be my plan. Um, every day before class, I'll send you an email that basically summarizes what we're going to do, anything that you need. It will have the previous day's lectures on them. And so, like I said, I'm, I'm going to tend, because we're a smaller group and because we're always going to be online, I'm just going to tend to do most of our business through email and not really use Moodle this block. Let's kind of skip the introductory stuff and just talk more about the kind of the course um, structure. So this, this course objective, this is an upper level seminar class, right? And so we're really going to try to develop some of the, some of the deeper um, insights that we tried to develop in economics. We're going to try to build economic models and learn how to think in terms of models. Uh, we're going to try to develop both an understanding of economic theory and economic empirics related to growth. We're going to do a lot of interdisciplinary stuff in this class, right? Actually, we're going to be talking a fair amount about economic history in this class. And so I think that's going to be important. We're going to develop our analytical and critical thinking skills, quantitative skills. Hopefully, we always do that in our econ classes. And then really importantly, in this class, you know, a big goal is to improve our written and verbal communication skills. So you all are, are taking this class under the old BA model, right? The, but there's the new BA model, Ingenuity. And one of the requirements of the new BA model is that every major is going to have to have a writing course in the major. And so this class is going to be the writing course in the major. And so while you, you all don't really need this requirement, I'm essentially treating this as a trial run for a writing class. So this will, in, in essence, be a writing class. And so one of the big things that we're going to do in this, this class is develop our writing skills. And as, as I'm going to talk about, we're going to have a big literature review paper. So one of the big assignments in this class is to do a literature review paper. And so when I say this is a writing course, what does that mean? Well, it means that we're going to write a paper in which we formulate a clear thesis and a frame a topic of inquiry. We're going to write and learn how to write in our discipline, right? So we're going to read economic papers and learn at least Try, try to improve our ability to write and communicate as economists and to use argument and to sustain evidence and use a variety of sources. We're going to try to understand a little bit about the style. What does it mean to write like an economist? And then we're going to do some revision. We're going to do some peer review. We're going to read each other's work. And so, you know, hopefully we will learn a little bit about the writing process here as we go forward. So, um, so this will be different than your other econ courses that you've taken is, is you know, um, depending on what econ or what ECB courses you've taken, you've probably done some writing, but you've probably never actually had an economics and business course that's taught as a writing class where we're purposely going to try to develop your writing skills. And so um, that, that's what I'm going to try to do this block. And as I said, this is the first time teaching this class as a writing course. And so... I'm sure there will be some bumps in the road and some things that will work well and some things that won't work well. And part of your job is to tell me what worked and what didn't work, right? So we can get it, 
get better next time. But, but that will definitely be one of the things that we think about here, this block. Let's talk a little bit about your grade and what are the assignments for this class. Well, we're going to have two midterms or two exams, or there's going to be a midterm and a final. The final is going to be a little bit shorter than the midterm. Uh, that's really going to reflect the fact that in many ways, this, is, this class is going to have two different parts. The first part is going to be, I would say, more me talking, <laughs> us talking about the literature related to economic growth, us reading some papers. The second half of the class is going to be, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, the first part is going to be more from your textbook and more kind of about theory. The second part is going to be more kind of reading articles and um, reading the original literature and getting prepared to write your own paper, right? And so the midterm is going to be, you know, I think at least this week, this first week is going to feel more like a traditional economics class, right? And then as we go along, I think it's going to be feel a little bit different as we kind of branch out into kind of some more smaller topics and read a little bit of original research in economics. So we're going to have two uh, exams. We, there might be a, a short empirical assignment. I haven't actually decided whether I'm going to give this to you or not, uh, but I, I left it in here. Um, class participation is a big part of your grade. This is a seminar class, and so participation means that you should be come prepared to write and talk and participate. And I realize that's that's hard in Zoom, right? It is is very easy to get into a passive mind mindset in Zoom and just, just kind of sit and let the information roll over you. But I really would like to try to encourage us to talk and to interact as much as we can. And there's definitely going to be um, definitely days in which the material is going to be more faci facilitate us talking <laughs> more. And so um, being prepared for class and is and um, participating in class participation is going to be a big part of this grade. Also, um, participating in the peer review process is going to be an important part of class participation. And so we'll talk more about that as we go along. And then finally, we're going to have this, this literature review uh, presentation. Okay. And so, as I said, maybe the big thing this block is for you to write this literature review paper, which I'm going to ask you to either review a book or three to four professionally published articles that along a related topic and basically present this research, right? Summarize it, explain why it's important to the questions that we're addressing in class, talk about what we learned from this. So I'm not gonna say too much about this, this, this assignment right now because it's the first day and nobody really, really wants to think about the paper quite yet. But as we get towards the end of this week, we're going to begin thinking about this, right? We'll have Megan Yamanishi from the library that will come and talk to us about how we can use the library to find articles along topics that we're interested in. Um, we'll have people from the Dungey Writing Center come in and kind of introduce to us and talk about the services they offer in terms of helping us to improve our writing and to write a paper like this. So we'll kind of talk about this more as time goes on, but you know, this is about a 3,500 page paper that we're looking to write here, which, you know, I think given that we're talking about three articles or so is really not too long, right? It's not an extremely long um, paper presentation. This is probably seven to 10 pages roughly. So uh, we'll write a paper and then also we'll spend the last couple of days of class where everybody will give a, a, a brief little presentation of their paper, right? And so this will be just kind of an, an opportunity for you to share what you've learned um, related to the topic that you're investigating with the rest of the class and how it fits into the, the big questions of the class, okay? So that will be the uh, paper and presentation. Here's the grading scale, pretty standard stuff. Um, academic honesty and learning disabilities, you're probably all I'm familiar with this. For some reason, I have students will not be allowed to use the bathroom during quizzes and exams. Oops, forgot to take that one out of the online. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and then here we finally have the outline and topics and readings. So every day, as I said, I'm gonna send you an email that basically has what we do. 
But this, if you need to look forward and, and look for some kind of important dates, this will have it. Um, just to pick out a couple of dates, um, you know, I, I hear I'm going to meet individually with each of you next Tuesday that begin talking about, or hopefully not begin, but begin talking, talking about topics and possible papers for you to review in your literature review. Um, it, the second Thursday, we're going to have our midterm exam. Your paper proposal will do the, be due the second Friday. First draft of your paper is actually due Wednesday of week three. We'll do peer reviews on Thursday of week three. The last week we're gonna do student presentations. Um, final draft of your paper will be due um, the fourth Tuesday and then we'll have that final exam, right? So you can kind of use this if you kind of forget where things are due or if, you know, I know that many of you have a lot of things going on. So if you kind of need to plan your time and um, the work when you have free time, you can work ahead. So we'll, we'll keep pretty close to this agenda. And if I deviate from it, I will definitely communicate with you about that in our emails or we'll talk about it in class. So, all right. So that is the, the basic syllabus. Does anybody have any questions about that in relation to just any of the mechanics of the class? While we're talking about mechanics of the class, I also shared with you this, um, this COVID addendum. Can you see this? It says ECB fourth, no, it shouldn't say 302, it should say 320. Everybody see this? No, hold on one second. Here we go. Everybody see this, it says ECB 5, 321, COVID, okay. So this is just a couple of, of rules, given that we're teaching this class online, kind of my expectations for how we should, um, we should behave ourselves online. And so whether we meet in person or on Zoom, we're a professional community. And so, you know, I really do expect us to, to kind of act as professionals. Um, I mean, I, it's not that I'm really worried about this, but I will say that I've had a couple of experiences this, this year teaching online where a couple of them, I, honestly, I would love to tell you. I had just the funniest experience this year teaching online, but I, I don't really feel like I can tell you because it's kind of outing the person, but it's hilarious. It is absolutely, it's a, sometime maybe when the class is over, you can reach out to me individually and I'll tell you the story, but. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it is easy to forget that people can watch us, right, when we're online. <laughs> and I'm recording you too, right? So we just have to just remember that and treat this like a professional experience, right? So, um, you know, uh, mute yourself when you're not speaking, focus your attention on the speaker, try not to eat things. I mean, I understand you get hungry. And it, it's, that's not a big deal, but try not to make a big production of eating a pizza or, you know, whatever, um, right? You, you use the raise hand feature. Um, if, if you wanna put a, a comment in the, in the chat room, feel free to do that. Sometimes though, I have to say I'm you know, usually teaching and trying to balance a lot of things and sometimes I don't see that. So you know, um, raise your hand or just let me know if you put something in the chat. Um, try to be here on time. Try to limit distractions around you. Once again, I realize that many of us are sharing spaces with roommates or whatever, but you know, just try to let the people around you know that it's distracting if there's a lot of traffic in back of you or you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, uh, if you feel comfortable using a headset with a microphone, you know, please do that. I think that that actually for, for many people helps reduce the distraction, which is great. Um, and then, you know, of course, as always, we just want to make sure that we are abide by Cornell's rules of civil discourse and we talk to each other professionally and, uh, you know, when we write to each other, we don't write in all caps because that's virtual shouting, right? <laughs> So I'll, you can read through this. This is just basically common sense stuff, and I'm not worried about any of you uh, not abiding by these rules. But it's just it's just best to make this all clear. Okay. Um, so are you ready to do this? Okay. Let's do this. So what 
are we talking about this block, right? What are we talking about this block? So um, I'm going to use here, I've had pretty decent luck using this iPad. And so I'm, I'm gonna use this a lot. This block is kind of like a, a, a board. Um, once again, let me know if you have a hard time seeing this. It, it is a little clunky sometimes writing things on this. So, and my writing is not great to begin with. So, you know, <laughs> I'll do the best I can, but always let me know. If, if there's things that you can't see or are having a hard time um, seeing. So this block, we really are talking about big three questions. Whoa. Hold on, someone's been screwing around with my Okay, the big three questions. Almost everything that we talk about in this class is gonna be related to one of three questions. The first question is why are rich countries rich and poor countries poor? And so this is a question related to differences in income levels. So we're gonna look at some data today that suggests that if you compare income levels in the United States to income levels in Ethiopia, income levels in the United States are about 60 times what they are in Ethiopia right? 60 times dramatic differences in income levels between different countries. And so we want to try to understand that, right? Why is it that basically a U.S. worker earns in a day what it takes an Ethiopian worker two months to earn? Right? We, need to kinda, we need to understand why there are such big differences in income levels. But related to that, we don't just see differences in income levels. We see differences in, in, in economic growth rates. Why are there big differences in economic growth rates across countries? So there's not just differences in income levels, but there's income differences in econ growth rates. In other words, how income is changing over time. So one of the things we see is that some poor countries are actually growing. Some poor countries are not growing. Some poor countries are growing faster than rich countries. So they're actually converging with, with rich countries. Some poor countries are growing slower than rich countries. So they're actually diverging from rich countries. Even among rich countries, we see a lot of, um, a lot of uh, variability, right? We have some rich countries that are growing relatively fast, some, countries, some rich countries that are growing relatively slow. So we need to understand not just how income, the level of income is different across countries, but we need to understand changes in income levels and understand why these changes are different across different countries. And then finally, we wanted to talk about how do we explain growth miracles and growth disasters. And by this, I mean poor countries who have a change and begin to grow very fast and begin to become rich countries. Those would be growth miracles. You know, 
Today, the classic example of a growth miracle would be China, right? China was one of the poorest countries in the world in 19, late 1970s. Today, it is a solidly middle-income country and is moving rapidly towards becoming, you know, a, in you know, a decade or so, um, technically a rich country, right? So we need to understand how exactly do we explain how a country goes from being poor to being rich. And then, of course, we see examples of the opposite growth disasters, countries that have gone from being rich to being relatively poor. Most people don't know, but in the mid 1800s, Argentina was as rich as the United States. And not just as rich as the United States, but if you actually looked at things like natural resources and political stability, Argentina looked to be, you know, by all means, just as likely to become a rich country as the US and yet it did not happen for the Argentina, right? And so why? How do we understand these things, right? How do we understand these things? So just to give you some heads up about these questions, these are all questions that we talked about in principles. These are all questions that we talked about in intermediate macro, for those of you who have taken that class, most of you have. So, you know, these, are, these should not be completely new questions to you. But I'll have to say that in both of those classes, we don't devote nearly enough time to thinking about these issues, right? And in particular, one of the things that happens is we kind of focus on the economics of, of these questions, but we don't focus on the interdisciplinary nature of these questions. And so one of the, I think one of the fun things about this class is that we will actually see that this is a fairly interdisciplinary class in the sense that while we'll start off talking about economics and economic theory, you'll see that as we move on, we're gonna move into talking about politics, talking about culture, talking about history, talking about philosophy, right? <laughs> we're gonna to have to move away from some of our strictly narrow economic questions to think more broadly about some of these issues, right? When we wanna explain the differences between countries, we can't do this only using economic tools. And so I think that's, that's one of the, the interesting things about this class is that, you know, I think in the end, we'll, take, we'll be able to take a fairly broad perspective on many of these questions. I think the other, to me, the other interesting thing about this class is that there's a fair amount of history in this class and not just kind of world history, but also the history of economic thought, right? So we're gonna kind of talk about how economists have over time come to think about the answers to these questions in different ways, right? That 50 years ago, economists had answers to these questions that are much different than how economists would answer these questions today. And so it will give some opportunity to talk about people like Adam Smith, right? You're all familiar with, the father of economics, David Ricardo, kind of the father of international trade, Thomas Malthus, right? Some of you heard about Malthusian economics, the father of demographics and population growth. We'll talk about Robert Solo, kind of the father of modern economic growth. Robert Lucas, the father of modern human capital theory. David Romer, kind of the father of or modern thinking about technology and where innovation and ideas come from. We'll do some reading by Darren Asimoglu, who in many ways is kind of um, the modern day political economist, right? Who talks about the interplay between economics and politics. Um, so it really kind of, it allows us to kind of think about how economic has evolved as we've tried to understand these questions more deeply and understand them from different perspectives, right? Before we, you know, begin to um, dig into this deeper though, I would like to take just a little bit of time and just try to, I don't know, I, I, convince is not the word, but, <laughs> but uh, implant on you how important these questions are, right? So, you know, we're economists and we tend to deal in the dry theory and the dry empirics and we see a lot of numbers. And so that happens, right? And we tend to, to you know, treat this very dryly. But it's really important for us to remember that these questions that we're talking about in terms of you know, human welfare are absolutely crucial, 
right? I mean, these are not just kind of esoteric questions that don't impact people's lives. They absolutely play a huge role in the way that people live, right? Today, we have just about, just a little bit less than 1 billion people that are living in extreme poverty across the globe. How do we define extreme poverty? Well, that's, that's a little hard to, um, that's quite a complicated question, but basically, um, economists today define extreme poverty as living on less than $1.75 a day. Okay, less than $1.75 a day in terms of purchasing power. So think about that. If you're living at less than, you know, what is it, roughly about $700 a year, right? We have almost a billion people living on less than $700 a year, right? And so that is uh, huge, right? That is huge. One, one of the things we know is that people that live in extreme poverty have a life expectancy of about 50 years relative to the life expectancy in rich countries of about 77 years. So you're talking about, at the very minimum, losing a third of your life on average by living in extreme poverty, right? Um, those who are living in extreme poverty, about 5,000 children a day who live in extreme poverty die from preventable diseases, right? Um, so, you know, it's... It, I'm going to show you some pictures here in a minute of what extreme poverty looks like, but this is a real thing, right? I mean, when you live in extreme poverty, it impacts every fact, every aspect of how you live your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the good news is that we've actually seen a quite a dramatic drop in the number of people living in extreme poverty, right? So if we went back, this, this really is hard to see, I apologize, but if you went back to 1990, which is at the beginning of this, we had more than 1.6 billion people living in extreme poverty. So in other words, as our population has gotten bigger, we've actually seen a reduction in the number of people living in extreme poverty, right? Which is, in many ways, one of the most important facts of the last 50 years, and probably the most underappreciated fact is that as we have more people in this world, we're actually today have less people living in extreme poverty. Where are these, you know, where have these dramatic gains been made? Primarily in South Asia. I don't know if you can see this, the shading is not very clear, but most of this drop has come in South Asia. And when we talk about South Asia, we're talking about China and India primarily, and primarily China, right? China now is claiming that they no longer have anybody living in extreme poverty, which is probably technically true. <laughs> um, that's not to say that, not, uh, that a lot of people in China are not living in something very close to extreme poverty, but, but technically that's an amazing accomplishment, right? Basically China has moved over 400 billion people right, I'll say that again, no, 400 billion, 400 million, 400 million people out of extreme poverty over the last 30 years. That's an amazing achievement. And it goes to show you how important growth is, right, because you don't move that many people out of, out of poverty without increasing the size of the pie, meaning increasing your economic growth rates. So um, yeah, that, that's the good news, right, that's the good news is that while there's still a lot of people living in poverty, uh, you know, really we've seen a dramatic fall in the number of people who are living in poverty. What does poverty look like? So I thought it would be interesting, um, particularly during this period of time of COVID, when nobody can travel, is to show you some pic pictures of what extreme poverty looks like. Sorry, here's baby pictures. You don't need to see this. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Is this working? Why is this not working? What in the world? Ah. This is so annoying. 
I had this nice little slideshow set up for you and now it's not. Okay, hold on for one moment. I'll find the pictures. We'll just do it the old fashioned way. Okay, so I, just to show you some pictures, I hope this works um, through screen sharing, we'll see. So this is a picture of the slum, a uh, famous slum in India, Dvarte, okay? Uh, if you are not familiar with um, the, the slum of Dvarte, you've all probably seen Slumdog Millionaire, right? Which is where supposedly the movie takes place. So this is outside of Mumbai. Okay, so um, Devarti has about 3 million residents in an area that's about nine, that's, wait, what is it? I think it's, a, it's an area that's about a square mile, right? It has 3 million residents. So just to put this into some perspective, it's really hard to, to kind of do this, but consider New York. New York has 26,000 people per square kilometer, okay? 26,000 person people per square kilometer. Devardi has 293,000 people per square kilometer. So about 10 times the population density of New York, right? <laughs> um, and so you, here's kind of like a, a, a little bit of an overview where you can see Devardi here, um, First off, there's like these these salt mines where people are mining and doing all this. And then you can kind of see over to the right where the actual buildings are in Devarti. And then in the background, you can see Mumbai, right, which is the major city in India. Um, let me just show you some other pictures. Did this picture show up of all the laundry? Ah, this is going to be a pain. Didn't show up. Uh, I'm gonna have to screen share this every time. All right, did that show up? I mean, I show you all these pictures because it's kind of difficult to, to work through here. But here's another picture of Devarti. You can see um, one of the things that happens is that really people live here to serve the rest of the city, right? And so one of the things that happens is that laundry gets done, right, in this part. That's something that people that don't have a lot of skills can do is do other people's laundry. And so you see these vast areas that are basically like laundry fac um, factories, right? Here's just an average street in Devarti. Um, you can just kind of see how narrow and dense things are. There's a lot of wires, a, a lot of informal building going on there. I'm trying to figure out the best pictures to show you. All right, here's an example of a typical housing complex, right, where you can just get a bit of a sense for the incredible population density. Now, you might be asking, why in the world, in a place that is so poor, would so many people want to live in a place that's so poor? <laughs> and, you know, the, the answer to this question is that this is really an economic empowerment zone. It's strange to think that people living in a slum are, are living there because they're empowered economically, but that is the case. Many slums pull people. They're not pushed into the slums, they're pulled into the slums because this is essentially an opportunity of an area where you can become 
self-employed, right? You can become self-employed by doing the things that other people don't want to do, like doing laundry, building bricks, doing, doing other dirty jobs, sorting recycling is a, is a common um, job in many of these slums, right? These are dirty jobs that nobody else wants to do, but it actually gives these people a sense of economic empowerment, right? And actually, Devardi has a higher standard of living than most rural villages in India does, right? And so when you go to visit one of these slums, and, and by the way, I know it's hard to think about traveling when you, um, in this age of COVID, but if you ever do get a chance to travel and to travel abroad, I highly recommend if you can, and there are tourist companies in most big cities that will take you on a slum tour. I really highly recommend you go, right? And I know some people feel a little uneasy about it because you know, it kind of feels like poverty tourism, right? You're just going to gawk at how people live. But quite, quite honestly, all tourism is going to gawk at how people live. Why should only rich people, <laughs> why should we only pay attention to rich people? We should be paying attention to everybody. And so I've actually found that, that you know, going to slums in many different parts of the world is actually a very um, educational thing, right? To kind of see how different people live. If I can give you another really quickly, because these pictures aren't pulling up very well. I'm not going to show too many pictures. But here's another example of a slum. And this is in Soweto, South Africa. So Soweto has a much, much different history than Davardi. Where you can think of Davardi pulling people to the slums, Soweto people were pushed to the slums. Right? And this is largely a remnant of apartheid. So in apartheid in South Africa, um, many black people were really kind of forced to live in concentrated areas, slums, right? And so Soweto is just outside of Johannesburg and one of the most kind of famous slums in the world. This is where uh, the slum where um, Desmond Tutu was born and um, uh, where, uh, Nelson Mandela, right, was born. In fact, when you go to Soweto, you can see they almost lived across the street from each other, which is kind of a, <laughs> an amazing thing. Um, but Soweto is a much different kind of slum. In, it, as I said, in the sense that people have been pushed into Soweto historically, not pulled there, but pushed. And so one of the different things you see about Soweto is that in Devardi, you kind of see it as an economic empowerment zone where people are working, and they're, they're pulled there because there's actually opportunities to do, do jobs. In Soweto, there's actually very little industry going on because that's not the way it was set up. It was basically set up as a place to force people to live, but to separate them from economic power, right? So just to show you a couple of other pictures here, um, it would be so much easier if I could just shoot through these. Here's a picture of Soweto. You can kind of see the very standardized housing here, the big power lines, right? <laughs> um, a lot of kind of informal land that's not really particularly taken care of. You know, one of the problems with informal land is that when nobody owns it, nobody takes care of it, right? And that's one of the things we tend to see in a lot of slums is they have a lot of informal land without official ownership. Right, here's kind of a traditional street, give you a sense for what the, the streets look like in Soweto, right? Kids playing with tires, right? <laughs> water standing in the streets. Um, you know, I mean, listen, these are actually, th this lane is actually a fairly middle class living in Soweto, right? I mean, this is not the poorest of the poor. In Soweto, there's about, there's on average one toilet for 100 people. Right, so the lack of basic infrastructure in places like Soweto is is really shocking, and of course it shows you something that we'll talk about a lot this year, which is the the fact that in many ways poverty is path dependent. Right, that once you get trapped into poverty, 
there's so many things that create a vicious cycle. And one of them is not having access to things like a toilet and clear sanitation, which tends to lead to poor health and poor health leads to missed school and leads to less productivity and it reduces your income and it makes you more vulnerable to getting sick and having a negative shock, which keeps you in poverty, right? These kind of vicious traps are a regular part of how people in slums, slums live. One last slum, right? This slum looks much different, but it's interesting to see, to think about, and this is in Shanghai, which as I said, Shanghai um, is really kind of, you know, China in general says that, they, that they've eliminated extreme poverty, but there are st still very poor sections of China, right? And so this is a, you know, for lack of a better word, a slum in Shanghai, a very, a relatively poor area in Shanghai where you can see how people live. This is actually a pretty nice area. Um, I should pull some other pictures here if I can. It's like a little bit more. And I had this working so nicely last night. Just to show you one picture, here's like, you know, for instance, this is a poor area of Shanghai. Actually, um, for those of you who are juniors, my hope is that I'll be going back to Shanghai in the in block four. Um, and so this is very actually very close to the university that we were staring at, but um, you can kind of see just kind of, once again, the lack of public infrastructure. Um, I thought I had some more pictures of like living arrangements in this area. I'll give you a picture of that. So this is, um, this is an interesting picture. So what this is, is this is an area where there's a lot of street food outside the university and everybody brings their, the street food vendors bring their, their food on bikes. Now, here's the interesting thing about this picture. Most of the people who sell street food here are not legal residents of Shanghai, right? Shanghai and all of China have what's called a hoku system, which basically means a residence permit system. It's like an internal passport where you are allowed to basically live for most Chinese in the place that you were born. But because the economic opportunities in Shanghai are so much better than they are in many other parts of, of China, a lot of people migrate to, to Shanghai. But because they do not have hoku permit, they are essentially illegal immigrants. And so these illegal immigrants do a lot of dirty jobs, including selling street food. And so this guy here, you see him sitting by the bikes. He's not just sitting there aimlessly, he's looking for cops. Because when he sees a cop, he yells and everybody grabs their stuff and throws it on the bike and takes off. <laughs> and so I actually saw this happen a couple of times while I was there. Um, it, so once again, this kind of is it, showing you a nat something that's interesting to think about in poverty, right? Is that many times people are, people that are poor are pulled to urban areas because, you know, there's economic opportunity there. But then also, there's other situations that push them into poverty. And one of the things that pushes people into poverty in China is the fact that many people are essentially internal illegal immigrants, right? They're illegal immigrants within their own country because they've moved to different parts of the world but they've, uh, they essentially don't have the full rights that um, other local people have if they have the, the proper um, paperwork, essentially. So anyway, I could show you a lot more pictures uh, it, that would be fun for us, but pulling out the individual and sharing them is kind of a pain in the ass. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of show you some of this because these are the things that we're going to be talking about, right? And when we get into the more esoteric kind of things that, that we will begin to get into today, it can seem kind of dry, right? And so as it gets dry, um, you know, we have to remember that this is about real people, right? And that these questions of growth and income levels and growth miracles 
um, change the lives of millions of people, right? In fact, in the words of Robert Lucas, you know, he kind of famously said, when you begin to think about these things and the impact that they have on people's lives, it's really hard to think about anything else, right? And so I kind of agree with that. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why I developed this course is that when I was in graduate school, I learned about some of the theories of economic growth and began to learn the literature. And as I learned the literature, it really kind of seemed like, sure, there's a lot of interesting things going on in economics, but really when you get down to the, to the nuts and bolts about what impacts people's lives, um, it's hard to think about anything other than growth, right? Because growth really is the key thing determines how we live, right? And how happy we are with our life. And if you don't believe that it determines how happy people are with their lives, I'll show you just one other picture here, not one other, but another picture, right? Here's just people's, once again, this is kind of hard to see, but this is a measure of people's dissatisfaction versus their standard of living, right? And so this, the vertical axis is here, how dissatisfied you are with your life. And the horizontal axis is how rich you are. And it's not surprising that people that are poor have more dissatisfaction with their life and people who are richer have higher satisfaction. So that's not to say that income is the only thing that makes us happy or unhappy, but it is a big thing, right? It is a very big thing. All right. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of an early break here. So why don't we take a, take a little, like an eight minute break, and then I want to come back and talk about seven facts related to economic growth, right? Seven facts that we're gonna to try to explain this, this year. So we'll take an early break and we'll all meet back here at 10 a.m., okay? All right, so get up and stretch yourself. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll leave Zoom up and running, so if any of you wanna kind of chit chat with each other or whatever, feel free to do that, okay? I'm gonna enjoy it. Good, good. Your connection okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Something wrong. Yeah, before the class. <laughs> okay, that's all right. That's all right. So, like I said, I, 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 you, it's all your job to like pay attention to me and make sure I'm recording. Right? <laughs> but I will try to do a good job of recording so that if right, if we have connection issues or get cut off or, you know, I have some kids who are schooling at home and sometimes they pull down my bandwidth to nothing. So right. It could be problems on my end too. So hopefully uh, if we record, we can you know, fill in any gaps that happen later. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the facts of economic growth. All right, some facts I wanna share with you that I think will inform a lot of our future discussions. Let's talk about some of these facts of, of related to growth. <clears throat> now, first off, as economists, we are gonna look at per capita GDP. That is gonna be our, our focus of attention. So before we even get into these facts, we need to talk a little bit about how we compare across countries. So for instance, if I told you that in 2017, US GDP was 17.7 trillion, and Chinese GDP was 75.2 trillion won, or RMB, okay? How exactly do we compare these things, right? I mean, how exactly are we supposed to compare these numbers? One's measured in dollars, the other's measured in RMB, All right? So three things that need to go into making an adjustment to GDP in each country so that we can make somewhat accurate comparisons across countries. First off, 
we always need to adjust for the exchange rate. But that is not going to be enough for us. We also have to adjust for differences in the price level or what we could think of as purchasing power. Because one of the things that we know is that many countries have difference in price levels so that a dollar will have more purchasing power in one place than it will another, okay? So hopefully you've all traveled enough to know that yes, some things are definitely cheaper in other countries in terms of purchasing power, right? So if I take a dollar and convert it into pesos, I'm actually gonna get more with those pesos in Mexico than I will in the US because there are many goods, not all goods, some goods are gonna be very similar in price in the US and some goods might actually be more expensive, but in general, a dollar's worth of local currency will buy you more in some places than it will in other places. And so we need to think about adjusting for differences in price level. That's what we call purchasing power. And then finally, we need to adjust for differences in the population. In other words, we need to make sure that we're looking at per capita data across countries, because it doesn't really make much sense to think about comparing GDP across countries. So let's do that. In terms of the first part, adjusting for the exchange rate, we know that one dollar at least in back in 19 or 2017, it's a little bit, the dollars appreciated a little bit now. The one dollar was about 6.14 RMB. What is it now? About 6.7, 6.8, I think, roughly. Um, so what we need to do is we need to take that 74. Sorry, 75, did I write down? 75.2 trillion and divide by 6.14 to put this in dollars. Breaking out my calculator. And I got 12.25 trillion dollars, right? So putting this into dollars, I'm left with $12.25 trillion. However, this is really understating Chinese GDP. Why? Because we know that 6.14 RMB will buy you more goods and services than $1 in the United States. Okay, in other words, the purchasing power of 6.14 RMB is greater than the purchasing power of $1 in the United States. In fact, economists have estimated this. This is actually a difficult estima estimation. I I'll tell you that th this, is, this estimation is fraught with lots of disagreement. <laughs> about exactly how big a difference in purchasing power is. But for the, back in 2017, the data that I found suggests that um, Chinese goods are about about 59% the price of similar US goods. So if we take that 12.25 trillion, oops, and we multiply it, one, 
by the ratio of one relative to 1.59. In other words, the purchasing power in the US is one, the purchasing power in, in China is 0.59. This will give us the purchasing power GDP. or about $20.75 trillion. In what we call purchasing power parity. Purchasing power parity. Finally, we have to adjust for population. So in the US, if we go back here, we knew US GDP was 17.7 trillion, and there were about 325.7 million people. This is about 54,000 dollars a person in per capita GDP. And for China, their purchasing power parity was 20.75, and there's about 1.38 billion, or about 1,386 million. or about $14,971 in per capita GDP. So in general, we can come to the conclusion, of course, with a lot, you know, with an error, right, there, there's a, confidence interval that we should place around this. But China has roughly about one third the per capita GDP that the US does. So these are the kind of data that we are going to be looking at when we compare income levels across country. We're going to be looking at purchasing power parity, exchange rate adjusted, per capita GDP, okay? <laughs> let, me, let me write that down. Purchasing power parity, exchange rate adjusted, per capita, Purchasing power parity exchange rate adjusted per capita GDP. That's what we're going to be comparing across countries. Recognizing that, you know, listen, there are limitations to our data here. And we could spend a lot more time. I'm just simply not going to get into it. But, but in fact, this is actually a great topic. If one of you are really interested in this data, there's a number of interesting papers out there looking at how exactly do I calculate purchasing power parity exchange rates across countries. So if you're looking for a literature review paper, here's a topic, right? Uh, looking at data on how do we actually calculate purchasing power parity across countries. How do we get data that accurately reflects living situation on the ground? But that's going to be the, the in, in principle, the kind of data that we would want to be looking at here when we, when we look across countries. So I want to talk about
seven big facts. And I want to talk about these facts uh, relatively quickly and show you a little bit of data. And these are going to be the facts that then we're going to try to develop a theory to fit these facts, right? So we're going to try to develop some explanation for these facts with the hope of trying to explain them so that we better understand why these facts exist. First fact, this one is not going to be at all surprising to us. is that there is enormous variation in income levels across countries. All right, there's enormous variation in income levels across countries. So in other words, we have rich countries and we have poor countries. I think I mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago that uh, in the US, we have about uh, 60 times the per capita GDP as Ethiopia, right? So on one day, a US worker earns about 60 times the, the what, or earns in, in one day about what it takes an Ethiopian worker 60 days to earn, right? To get some idea of just how big this disparity is, let me show you a figure. This is from your book. Okay, figure 1.1 in your book. Hopefully you can see this a little bit. So this is looking at the distribution of world population by GDP per worker, okay? So the vertical axis here is, looks at the percent of the world's population relative to how much GDP per worker is relative to the US, right? So if, to put this another way, what percent of the world, it, or you know, 10% of the world here is living at a very small fraction of US GDP per worker, right? So here's 20% of US GDP per worker, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100%. Look here, if we go up to 20% of US GDP per worker, notice that about 70% of the world's population is living at, at or less than 20% of US per capita GDP right? 70% of the world's population is living at less than 20% of U.S. income levels. That's a lot of inequality, right? <laughs> that is a lot of inequality, right? You take a fifth of U.S. per capita GDP, which is roughly about $10,000 a year, right? About 70% of the world's population is living at less than $10,000 a year. So when you begin to think about what that means for what kind of health care you have or what kind of um, education you can purchase your kids or other things related to the standards of living, that is pretty big inequality, right? There's enormous variations. However, there is a little bit of good news. And the good news is that the world is becoming slightly more equal. So this is looking at the same data, but here broken into percentiles. So for instance, what percent of the world's population lives at 10% of US GDP? 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. The black line is where we were in 1960. The gray line is where we are in 2008. And notice here that in, in particularly these percentiles down here at the very bottom, there's, ma there's many less people living here at less than 10% US, US income. Where are those people? Well, they've moved up to 10 and 20%, right? <laughs> which is not a big jump, but it is a jump. And you notice outside of that, many of these other factors, you see actually, you know, some movement towards the middle class, right? That many people have been re removed out of the very bottom and have moved into the, 
you know, the 10 to 20 or the 20 to 30 percent. And so that's good news, right? That's good news. Who's doing this moving? Once again, largely people in China and India. Right? And we're gonna, that's going to be a recurrent theme that we see, is that a lot of the improvements can be, be traced exactly to two countries, right? what's happened in China, what's happened in India. So in China, a huge, a huge part of this block here has just moved here, right? And the same for India, right? A, a lot of those people live in either India or China. So there's big variation in income levels. There is also enormous variation in growth rates. Right, enormous variation in growth rates across countries. <clears throat> This afternoon, we'll spend a little bit of time actually calculating a growth rate. But the important thing that we know about growth rates is compounding. Small differences in growth rates lead to big differences in income levels. over time. And so where do these big differences in, in income levels come from? They actually come from small differences in growth rates. And the fact that we have big differences in growth rates between countries just goes to show you how many countries can radically catch up or fall behind. There's a lot of possibility here for catching up and falling behind. So, um, Just to get a feel for this here, <clears throat> um, this is just a, a selection of countries to get some feel for how much variation there is in terms of growth rates, right? So you have countries like the U.S. who, between nine, or I'm sorry, like China, between the U, between 1980 and 2015, grew at about eight percent a year, right? India grew at 4.1 percent, Ireland 3.3, the U.S. 1.6, and then you get down here to Countries like Argentina, less than 1%. Zimbabwe, negative 0.9%, right? That's a killer because our Zimbabwe started out poor and has gotten poor, right? These are big, big variations, right? These are big variations. And they go to show you how big variations in income levels happen over time. One of the easiest ways to kind of think about the importance of, of differences in growth rates is to talk about the rule of 70, which hopefully is something you're all familiar with. I know we definitely talk about it in principles and talk about it intermediate. And the rule of 70 is, is just kind of a rule of thumb that tells us how long it takes something to double. If something's growing at G percent a year, it doubles in size every 70 divided by G, G years. So think about China. China is growing at 8% a year.
it's doubling every seven, doubling a little bit less than every nine years. What about Argentina? It's growing at 1% a year. Meaning roughly, it takes about 70 years to double. Or to put this in another context, what's gonna happen over the next 70 years? Argentina will double once, they will get twice as rich. What would happen to China if this continues? China doubles once, twice, three, four, about nine times over the next 70 years. So you can see how much radically different, how much radically more rich China will be over the next 70 years if it continues to grow at 8% a year. Now that is a huge if, that will not happen, right? For reasons we talk about, China will not continue to grow at 8% a year for the next 70 years. But just using this as an example of how differences in growth rates can lead to enormous differences in levels over time. So if China and Argentina started at roughly the same spot, China is gonna be about nine times richer at the end of these 70 years than Argentina is, right? That's the power of compounding, right? That's the power of compounding. And that is how countries catch up, right? That's how countries catch up. So one of the things that we observe here is that we definitely see two phenomena, convergence and divergence. And we're gonna talk about this quite a bit as we go through the class. That among some countries we see convergence, meaning per capita GDP levels are becoming more equal. But we also see divergence. I won't rewrite this whole thing, but just to say per capita GDP levels becoming less equal. So if we you know, go back to this table that I showed you a minute ago, China and Ireland and India are converging with the United States because they're growing faster than the United States. France, Argentina, and Zimbabwe are diverging from the United States because they're growing slower than the United States and they're, they're poor, right? So this whole idea of convergence and divergence is really happening at the same time. It depends upon which countries you're talking about, right? So we have big differences in income levels, but then we also have big differences in growth rates, okay? That's the first two facts that obviously we're gonna have to try to explain. Third fact. This is both the good news and the bad news. Growth rates are not necessarily constant over time. Countries can grow slow. Or vice versa. China is a classic example of this. In the year 1200, they were basically the richest country in the world.
from a period of 1200 to about 1979, one of the slowest growing countries in the world. And from 1979 to today, one of the fastest growing countries in the world. So growth rates can change. It, they are not just some predetermined lock. Um, there's some clues that we can take away from this, right? Right off the bat, there's two clues that I can take from this, is that growth is not usually a function of things that countries can't control. <laughs> growth is controllable. So for instance, one of the theories that I often hear, you might have heard these kind of theories, is that there are some cultures that are better for growth, that some countries just have a cultural inclination for growing. Um, I'm gonna call bullshit on that, right? <laughs> and how, has the culture of China changed? Did China have a culture that was against growth and then have a ch culture that changed to being towards growth? No, I don't think so, right? Another thing that really calls into question is this idea that how rich you are depends upon what your level of natural resources are. Once again, I think we can think of lots of examples of countries that don't have a lot of resources that have been poor and then have gotten rich. And China is actually a pretty good example of that, right? It's not, a, it wouldn't jump to the top of your list of countries that are, that have this great, you know, wealth of natural resources. China pretty much had the same natural resources when it was poor as when it was rich, right? And so this idea that somehow natural resources or culture are the big determinants to growth, uh, you know, I, I, I think we need to look for something that's, that can change, right? Because those are two things that, that aren't very easy to change. What if we look at the world in general? One of the things that we see for the world in general, though, is that the world is growing faster. Here's looking at world per capita GDP and the growth rates. And one of the things that we've seen here is that the world economy is growing faster than it ever has before. And this is the good news. Once again, a lot of this is driven by China and India, right? <laughs> um, because these are two big economies that for a long period of time did not grow hardly at all and now are growing. But it's also true that growth is more broad than it's been before, right? Many countries in Asia, there's some countries in, in South America that have grown, that have joined the party, right? And so more countries are growing than they have um, in the past. And so that's the good news, right? That's the good news. All right, fact number four. Right? Because growth rates can change, countries can move from poor to rich and vice versa. In other words, this is the growth miracle, growth disaster. phenomena that we will need to talk about. And for every growth miracle, like China, there have been growth disasters like Zimbabwe, or honestly, largely sub-Saharan Africa, right? That while we see parts of the world that are growing quickly and catching up, we see other parts of the world that simply are not growing or maybe for a while grew, but have stopped growing and as a result have fallen behind. And as I said, that today 
um, though not entirely, is largely in, in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Which is really the, the part of the world where most of the extreme poverty remains. And we have some of the, the, the slowest growth rates, right? So where, where we see most of the divergence occurring. What about the United States in particular, right? We're taking this class in the United States. Obviously, we have maybe a particular interest in the US economy and its role in all this. Well, the US in many ways is unusual for this reason. In the US, per capita GDP growth has been remarkably steady. If you ask me what's the most amazing thing about US growth experience, it's not that the US has grown so fast. It's that it's grown so steadily. The US has never had a growth disaster period, right? In part because we've never fought, other than the Civil War, never really fought a major war on US soil. Uh, we've never had massive political instability or some of these other things that can play a very big role in growth. The thing about the US economy is we just kind of keep trucking along. Right? <laughs> we kind of keep trucking along. So just to show you this a little bit. So here is per capita GDP growth in the United States. And the black line is the actual growth rate. But if you fit a trend line to this, you'll see that for the most part, the US sticks pretty closely to that trend line. The 1930s and 1940s were obviously big outliers. That was the Great Depression and World War II. But if you take out that period, the US has, has pretty remarkably followed this trend growth line of a little bit less than 2% a year. Per capita GDP growth has grown a little bit less than 2% a year, pretty much day in and day out, right? And that in many ways is the strength of the US experience, right? <laughs> the fact that we have steadily grown and taken advantage of compounding. And so the fact that US pretty much compounds at a 2% a year, you do that over you know, 200 years and before you know it, you're pretty rich. And that is basically where the US is, right? So while growth has never been, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years hasn't been nearly what it is in China, you know, once again, that's not really been the, the strength of the US experience, right? And as we're gonna see, there's a reason why China has grown at 8% a year, and that's because for a long period of time, it grew so slow. So the fact that the US has been so steady is in many ways its strength, right? In many ways, its strength. And so to kind of see what this means in practical terms. Here's just, oops, here's just a table that shows you what US GDP is per capita in 1900 relative to 2015. So basically in 2015, if per capita GDP in the US in 1900 was 100, our per capita GDP in 2015 would be 804. We are about eight times richer than we were 115 years ago. That's what that steady growth compounds to, right? So, you know, standards of living have increased dramatically, steadily, right? <laughs> Not dra dramatically, right? But steadily growth has increased or growth has continued in the US and over time that compounds into dramatic increases in the standards of living, right? And so as we'll talk about, you know, th th these increases in standards of living have dramatic effects on how we live our life. There's a real question as to whether you would want to be you today or the richest person in the United States in 1900. You know, I would think it's quite reasonable to prefer to be you today than the richest person in the world in 1900, right? <laughs> because if you think about that richest person in the world, yeah, they were rich, 
but they didn't have a lot of the things that you have, right? They didn't have the internet, they didn't have vaccines, they didn't have antibiotics, they didn't have indoor plumbing. <laughs> well, maybe they did, because I guess probably they did. Um, but there were a number of modern conveniences, right, that translate directly to our standards of living that have essentially made middle class and even poor people rich in the sense of how people lived 100, 100 plus years ago. And so these are the, you know, the day-to-day -day practical ramifications of all this growth, right? And you can't underestimate the power of sustained growth to change people's lives. Okay, almost done here. Just a couple more facts. Fact number six, one of the most steadily reliable pieces of data that we have about growth is that countries that trade more grow faster. In other words, international trade is good for growth. There are so many things that economists disagree upon. But one of the things that economists do not disagree upon is that international trade is good for growth. International trade in the aggregate is beneficial. There just is not any really real argument about this amongst economists, which is why it is so frustrating to hear so much of our political debate today <laughs> and see it devolve into the idiocy that it largely has related to this issue of international trade because the evidence is so strong. Just to show you one piece of evidence, and then we'll, we'll talk about this much more, and this of course would be an excellent topic for your literature review. If you want to think about, read some of the papers on, on looking at the relationship between international trade and GDP, but just here's one figure, right? Looking at the average growth rate of international trade on the vertical axis versus the average growth rate of GDP. And we see this very, very strong correlation between countries that trade more and countries that grow faster. And pretty much the economic history of the last 50 years, particularly among emerging market economies, is that those countries that have opened up and have looked to trade more have converged. They have grown faster, right? You look at all, all those Asian countries like China, like Japan, like South Korea, right? A fundamental aspect of their development policy was to trade more. And then you look at those countries that have not converged. Here we're talking about countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, talking about countries in South America. What's the one thing they have in common? Well, they have many things in common, but one strong thing they have in common is an inability to open up their markets to trade, right? And so we will talk about why this is so important going forward. But trade is absolutely one of the things that countries need to do if they wanna improve their standards of living and grow faster, right? There's debate in our politics about this, but there is no debate among economists, or really not any debate. Of course, the key thing to note here is while it makes the country richer, it's not necessarily going to, trade's not necessarily going to make every individual in the country richer, right? <laughs> and that, of course, is the root of our political disagreements, is that individually trade creates some winners, but it also creates some losers. And that has been where the political problem has been created is that, you know, I would say, you know, the problem with most of our trade policy here in the US is that we haven't spent enough time compensating losers. And as a result, those losers are pissed off now. <laughs> and coupled with not being very well informed, you end up in the situation that, that we're in right now, right, in many ways. Okay, last fact. And in many ways, this fact is just as important as any of the, the others, maybe, maybe the most important in some ways.
determining how rich you are. Where you are is much more important than who you are. This is just an astonishing number. It's hard to wrap your mind around this. What is the most significant predictor of how rich you are? Far and away, the simple answer to the question, where do you live? 77% of the variability in global incomes across people can be simply explained by where you live. So if you tell me that you live in South Korea, I will be pretty accurate about where you live, how much income you, I can, I can pretty accurately predict your income simply by knowing where you live. If you live in South Korea, that's gonna be one income level. You live in the US, that's gonna be another. Zimbabwe, that's gonna be another, right? And that is far and away gonna be the biggest determinant of where you live not who you are. Who you are, meaning how smart you are, how hard you work, what your education levels is, what job you pick, is actually a very small determinant of how rich you are. <laughs> when put in this way, this really looks a lot like a global lottery. In the sense that people who are lucky enough to be born in rich countries, are gonna be richer. And people who are unlucky enough to be born in poor countries are gonna be poor. It also explains the huge economic incentive for migration. Because what do we see? People who migrate from a poor country to a rich country immediately and drastically increase their potential income. We'll talk uh, many times here this block about something called the citizenship premium, which is something I've already talked about in principles and intermediate. This is kind of an idea that probably many of you are familiar with. But the citizenship premium looks at somebody from the Congo why the Congo? Because the Congo is the poorest country in the world. What happens if that Congolese worker migrates? What percent will they increase their income if they migrate to a different country? They will increase their income by 9,200%. In other words, a factor of 92 times by migrating to the US. Seventy-one hundred percent if they migrate to Sweden, or a factor of seventy-one times. Thirteen hundred percent if they migrate to Brazil. or 300% if they migrate to Yemen. These are huge economic incentives to migrate, right? <laughs> and so you can see why people risk life and limb to migrate. 
This also suggests a huge market failure in the sense that why shouldn't these people be able to migrate? They obviously become much, much more productive when they come to the United States. This is an argument not just for migration, but for allowing migration. Because when people come here, they become much, much more productive. So you've probably heard the old saying in, in real estate, what are the three most important things in real estate? Location, location, location. Well, really the same thing comes to economic growth. Location, location, location. It is not the person that matters so much as it is where. It's not who, it's where that matters. And so we're gonna explain economic growth. We've got to understand this, right? We absolutely have to understand why is location so important? So when we talk about, for instance, poverty, Here's a little graph. Where is global poverty? It's in the tropics. Right, here's a map of the world. Purple is high income, and orange and yellow is low income. And look, it's the tropics, right? Particularly sub-Saharan Africa, right? Global poverty is concentrated just like global wealth is concentrated by location. And so, so much of this just basically relates to where you are. That is something our theories have to understand. We have to understand why is location so important to, to predicting why some countries are rich and other countries are poor, right? What is it about location? What is it about the geography of growth that plays such a big role? So that's where we're going to begin here over the next couple of days. So we're going to come back this afternoon. Got to do it. And what I want to do this afternoon is I want to review a little bit of the mathematics of growth, right? So this is something that it's, I think most of this is a review. Uh, some of this is a review from principles. It's certainly a review of a lot of things we talked about in intermediate macro. So max should be, a lot of what we talked about this afternoon should be fresh in your mind. But we want to talk about um, kind of the mathematics of growth to get us ready to begin talking about the solo model, which is what we're gonna do on Tuesday, okay? So if you wanna uh, look ahead a little bit, um, a lot of what we talked about this afternoon is in Appendix A of your book, so you can look at that briefly. Um, but like I said, I, I think most of what we talked about this afternoon is more, I consider a refresher. Hopefully it's, it's concepts that you've seen before. They're not things that are completely new to you, okay? So we will do that at 12.30. My hope is the class won't be much more than an hour, so we'll be done around 1.30 or so. So um, anyway, I'll see you back at that time, all right? Okay, have a good lunch.